And you know something? They had a debate Thursday night between George W. Bush and John F. Kerry. And I found it interesting that the next morning, on the front page of USA Today, it said, One War, Two Views. And that was the headline on the story about the debate. And I really thought that was funny. Now, I didn't watch the debate. I did get a transcript of it afterward, and I read not all of it, but some of it. And as there, to there being two different views, I find that a little hard to believe. They have agreed that preemptive wars are okay. They have agreed that no other country should have a veto over the United States decisions. They have a veto. They have agreed that the U.S. should be rebuilding Iraq, that it should stay there until I really don't know when, when there's no more crime in Iraq, when there's no more people being killed, when there's no more destruction. Heavens, we got that in the United States, and all the troops are over there in Iraq. So I don't know how long they're thinking, but they both agree that it's, the U.S. has to stay there, and it has to train Iraqi forces. And they both say that the U.S. should be strong and resolute in the war against terror, uh, they both say that they're going to hunt down and kill terrorists. They both say the world is safer without Saddam Hussein in power. They both say that it is important to step up homeland security. And you know what that means. It means more and more impositions, intrusions, and oppression at airports and with email and warrants, warrantless searches, and so forth and so on. So I'm not really sure what it is they disagree on, except I guess one of them thinks that George Bush should be president and the other one thinks John Kerry should be president. Beyond that, I don't see much. They both, as far as other things are concerned, believe that the U, uh, U.S. government should be heavily involved in health care, heavily involved in education, that the U.S. government should be spending more and more and more and more and more money all the time. They both seem to agree that the government is everything and that every problem we have in society should be solved by the government. So I don't know what the two views are on the war or anything else. George Bush has an interesting strategy, though, for being president, and I have to hand it to him. He said that it was very important that we not change course, that we not change horses, that we keep the leadership as long as this uh, war in Iraq is going on and as long as the war on terror is going on. So there is something that future presidential prospects are going to take to heart. If you can get into the White House, the important thing to do is to start a war and then tell the people that they should not change horses in the middle of the stream. Way, 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 way back when I remember that slogan in Roosevelt's 1944 presidential campaign when he was running against John Dewey. Thomas Dewey, excuse me. Thomas Dewey, the New York governor who was the Republican candidate for president. And the slogan was just repeated over and over again. We shouldn't change horses in the middle of the stream. The stream being the war that was being fought in World War II. Another interesting thing I saw about the de in the transcript of the debate was that Bush says, I went to the United Nations. I didn't need anybody to tell me to go to the United Nations. I decided to go there myself. Well, good for you, George. And I went there hoping that once and for all, the free world would act in concert to get Saddam Hussein to listen to our demands. They passed the resolution that said, disclose, disarm, or face serious consequences. I believe when an international body speaks, it must mean what it says. Saddam Hussein had no intention of disarming. Why should he? He had 16 other re resolutions and nothing to, took place. As a matter of fact, my opponent talks about inspectors. The facts are that he was systematically deceiving the inspectors. End of the quote from Bush from the debate of Thursday night. It's amazing that if, after all this time, nobody has told George W. Bush that there were no weapons there to disarm. Over and over he has said this. We told Saddam Hussein to disarm and he wouldn't do it, so we had to go in there. Hey, wait a minute. How was he going to disarm when he didn't have any weapons to begin with? Was he supposed to unload his rifles? Was he supposed to throw all the knives in the Tigris and throw all the pistols in the Euphrates River? Is that what George Bush means by disarm? It is the strangest thing that he continues to go on and talk about the fact that we had to go in there to disarm Saddam Hussein when it's long since been established that there was nothing in there to disarm and that Saddam Hussein was not deceiving anybody. He said he didn't have any weapons of mass destruction, and lo and behold, that's the way it turned out. Now, as far as I'm concerned, this is Harry Brown speaking now, not George W. Bush, if he had had weapons of mass destruction, it still would not have been our business to go in there and depose him. We're not going into England to depose Tony Blair because he's got weapons of mass destruction, or into Russia to depose Valerie Putin because he's got weapons of mass destruction, or into Pakistan to destroy, uh, to depose, well, let's destroy him while we're there, Musarev, because he's got weapons of mass destruction, same thing with Israel, same thing with China, same thing with India. No, 
So why is it that Saddam Hussein is so special? And now that they're starting to build the PR campaign to go after Iran, saying that Iran has weapons of mass destruction, why do we have to go after Iran? Are we the world's policemen, and are we the only people allowed to have weapons of mass destruction? As far as I'm concerned, it is just as dangerous having weapons of mass destruction that can be released on the world by pushing a red button in the White House of Washington, D.C., United States of America. That is just as dangerous as Saddam Hussein having chemical, biological, or even nuclear weapons. There was another debate Thursday night also. It was held also in Coral Gables, like the bush Kerry debate. In fact, it was actually just across the street. I was quite surprised it was so close to the bush Kerry debate because the way things have been going, I thought they'd have the whole state of Florida de declared a, an area, a secure area that nobody could enter so that nobody would get too close to George Bush, and George Bush might see a sign or a picket or something else that was anti-Bush, and we can't have that. We must preserve at all costs the president's morale so that he can fight this war on terror. But the debate across the street was between Michael Badnerick, the libertarian presidential candidate, and David Cobb, the Green Party's presidential candidate. And the debate lasted, I believe, about an hour and a half. I was there, and I saw it. And I have to say, the debate was not very well organized, and I can't tell you offhand what the name of the organization was that arranged it. It was neither one of the two parties. It was some other organization interested in expanding democracy. And I don't think I'd mention it even if I could remember the name, because I don't want to put them down. And I have to realize, too, that the debate was really put together very, very quickly. I believe it was less than a week that it... Uh, less than a week in advance that the whole thing started, the process of arranging it. And Ralph Nader, I believe, said at first he was going to be there, then changed his mind, said he wasn't sure, and then finally did not show up. Why the Constitution Party candidate was not there, I don't know. And I don't know why the Socialist Party or the Peace and Freedom Party or the American Nazi Party or any other third party didn't have a candidate there. But it was between Badnerick and Cobb, which made it simpler. And... It was fairly lengthy, I believe, as I said, about an hour and a half, of which most of the time was questions from the audience. The two candidates made opening statements, and the two candidates made closing statements, and the moderator was Jennifer Van Bergen, who is a liberal located there in the Florida area. She's involved with the ACLU and a lot of other causes and has made a specialty of dissecting the Patriot Act, and we may have her on the show in the near future because... I think that she's probably the only person I've come across that has really investigated the Patriot Act from one end to the other to such an extent that she could probably give us a good summary of exactly what it does do and what it doesn't do, rather than the kind of vague, uh, I shouldn't say hysteria, but it seems to rightfully cause hysteria, but the kind of uh, vague understanding uh, that it's just really delving very deeply into the rights that we should have as citizens. In any event, she asked a few questions to start it off, and then it went to the audience. And that's not the best format in the world. It's nice that a few questions come from the audience to uh, provide a forum for public participation, but it probably would have been better if the candidates asked each other questions, or perhaps even better yet, if there had been three or four panelists there to ask questions, and that the panelists had been chosen from different kinds of perspectives so that the questions would not be all in one direction the way they were in the bush Kerry debate with James Lehrer asking all the questions. And any of those things would have made it more interesting than it was. I would not want to say that there was a winner or loser in the debate because the fact of the matter is that I would think that most every libertarian in the room walked away thinking that Badnerick had won the debate. And every Green Party member that was in that room walked away thinking that David Cobb had won the debate. The reason for that is that it is natural for someone to believe that only his man actually raised the important issues, that the other guy was talking about irrelevancies, that the other guy was going off on tangents and so on. That's the way people respond to a debate. That's why views are not changed. But they can be opportunities, again, just like any other forum, a radio broadcast, a speech, a letter to the editor, uh, whatever it may be, it can be a forum for moving people a few feet along the political spectrum in your direction. And I don't know how effective Michael Badnerick was in that regard, or David Cobb was. I have to say David Cobb was by far the better public speaker. He was more animated, uh, he was more intense, and he... I think, raised his supporters to a higher level of enthusiasm than Badnerick raised the Libertarian supporters. But that's not everything. 
in political context, the most important thing that a candidate of a third party can do is to try to raise awareness. Uh, where, pardon me, try to raise awareness of alternatives that people had not heard about before. Now the problem is that C-SPAN pulled out. C-SPAN was going to televise the show. And then C-SPAN pulled out because the facilities were so difficult. It was in a Holiday Inn, as I say, across the street from the University of Miami, where the bush Kerry debate was. And the facilities there were very, very bad. C-SPAN would not have transmitted it live, so they didn't need any sophisticated equipment there. All they needed to do was to simply tape uh, what they had to uh, to tape and then send it back to Washington, and it would have shown up on the air on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, who knows when. And they decided not to do that. Instead, uh, Pacifica had the rights from the organization that set up the debate and two more to follow. Pacifica Broadcasting had the radio rights to it, and Free Market News Network had the Internet rights. And Free Market News Network had two video cameras there, taped the entire proceeding, plus some interviews I did afterward with Bad Narek, Cobb, Van Bergen, the moderator, and John Anderson, the 1980 independent presidential candidate who gave uh, a little short speech at the beginning. I interviewed those people, and I also uh, gave a little talk before the whole proceeding started, which is also on Free Market News Network site, about why third-party candidates don't get into the debates and how uh, third-party candidates are going to have to get around these things to circumvent the barriers that have been put there by the main parties. I said before we went to the break that Free Market News Network has the Internet rights to the third-party debates, and they had two cameras at the a third-party debate Thursday evening, and the because they couldn't transmit from the Holiday Inn, they taped the proceedings and immediately rushed it back to the studio, which was not too far away. The network is located in South Florida, in Pompano Beach, and they put it on the air by about midnight or 3 a.m. A lot of traffic uh, on the Internet on Wednesdays talked about the third-party debate and the fact that Free Market News Network was going to cover it, and their visitor traffic jumped up tremendously, uh, hitting about 170,000 visitors on Wednesday, and then on Thursday it was well over 300,000, and at a few points the servers simply just broke down. They um, Actually, it wasn't the servers of Free Market News Network, but of the firm that was transmitting it out into cyberspace for them, and they have decided to do this all on their own in the future so that they're never dependent upon another company and never have to compete with other networks uh, or other Internet sites for the bandwidth. And in any event, it, uh, the third-party debate obviously caused a lot of interest for there to be that kind of traffic. So that, of course, is a good sign. And you can see the debate, if you would like to actually see the video of it, by going to freemarketnews.com. And I've got a link to that site on the Radio Links page of my website. My website is harrybrown.org. You go there, and right at the top of the home page, you'll see a link to Radio Links, where I put links to articles and websites mentioned on the show, and there is a link there tonight to Free Market News Network. And Free Market News Network, which I have become associated with to a certain extent, uh, they call me their senior political analyst, uh, is really an amazing outfit. They are providing articles, audio, and video. And there is a lot of investment news, but there's a great deal of political news and commentary. And it is a news site. There is a crawl line across the top with investment news. There are news articles on there, but there is also a great deal of commentary. And they carry my articles there along with articles from Lou Rockwell Com and a lot of sources around the country. They also uh, provide audio and video. I have done several audio interviews for them with someone interviewing me, and those are on the site that you can get to easily. Everything is archived. Nothing disappears from the site. And I have also taped with them a number of video commentaries. I did one the, this past week on taxes, which is already up on the site. I've done them before on subjects that escaped me at the moment, but while I was there, I did one on getting government completely out of schooling, and I did one on foreign policy. I did one on why less government means less crime, a subject we talked about on this show about three or four weeks ago. And all of these are in the can there and will be released at the rate of about one a week. So my point is, you can understand if they're having me on there talking about subjects like that, you can imagine that the other things that they have on there are going to be very, very interesting and provocative also. So it really is quite an undertaking. Anthony Weil, who is the president of Free Market News, is determined to create a libertarian news and information site that is going to go far, far beyond anything that's done before and he already has gone far, far beyond. I mean, this site now is easily a competitor to World Net Daily, which is a conservative site. Uh, I say it's easily a competitor. It probably is already surpassing World Net Daily in terms of traffic and everything else. And it's going to be a very, very valuable resource for the libertarian community. And I have in mind having Anthony Weil on the show as a guest in coming weeks.
We've not had many guests on the show. In fact, uh, we've only had a couple of them since we started on Genesis so a couple of months ago. But next week, Michael Badnerick will be on the show for an hour, provided something more important for him doesn't come up, a more important campaign event, which I would understand if he canceled for that purpose. But as it stands now, he will be on the show next week. As I mentioned earlier, I'm thinking of having Jennifer Van Bergen on because I think she will be an interesting guest talking about the Patriot Act from someone who's really scoured the thing from one end to the other. And I think it will be very interesting to have Anthony Weil on. He's a very articulate fellow and can explain what it is he's trying to accomplish. But summed up in a nutshell, the slogan of the network there now is what you want when you want it. And that's the wonderful thing about the Internet. I don't have it at, at my command here, but I was told this past week that a recent poll indicated that a little over half of the people who were asked in the poll now rely on the Internet as their main source of getting news instead of relying on TV for news. That means more people go to the Internet to find out what's going on in the world than listen to the news channels like CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, or the evening news on ABC, CBS, and NBC. And that's really an important statistic, but it's also an understandable one. The Internet's a far, far better source for news because when you go to the Internet, you can go whenever you want. And you don't have to sit through long, long dis- uh, uh, coverage of the hurricanes in Florida if what you want are the stock market reports or if what you want to know is what happened in the debate last night or this, that, or the other thing. Instead, you go to the Internet, and there's a whole menu for you to choose from and instead of having to go from top to bottom you just go straight to the one that you want to know about and you do it whenever you want it really is what you want when you want it and i would say that within the next couple of years it'll probably be 75 or 80 percent of people will rely on the internet so an outfit like free market news network is getting out ahead of the curve they're getting really on the front lines they have purchased a ton of very sophisticated equipment to handle this to make sure that they never get overloaded to make sure that they're capable of doing all sorts of things like this video and audio stuff and It really is the harbinger of the future, and so I'm glad to be involved with it. I think it's very, very exciting. And let's take a few email questions. Jan in Fort Collins, Colorado, wants to know what was difficult about the third-party debate location that made C-SPAN pull out, but Free Market News Network was able to run two cameras. Well, I think that part of it may be that C-SPAN has a system whereby they actually do transmit back to their studio, even though they are not feeding that out on the air at that time. In other words, the actual taping of the show is done in the studio, and then it is uh, aired at some time in the future. Now, I don't know that for a fact, but I suspect that that may be the case, and there was just no way to transmit the kind of bandwidth needed in order to do that from the Holiday Inn in Coral Gables, California. The organizers just did a poor job of selecting the location, a poor job of setting it up. It was amateurishly done. There were people who were associated with it who were walking around behind the speakers, in full view of the audience and the cameras, uh, walking in front between the speakers and the cameras and so forth at various places in it. And it may just be that uh, C-SPAN was intending to tape on site, but then when they saw how the thing was organized and felt that this was not going to be a very professional production, that rather than spend the money to send people and equipment and so forth down to Florida, it would be better to do to have them go someplace else and tape something else. Rob in Ann Arbor, Michigan, says you may be aware that Dr. Leonard Peikoff of the Ayn Rand Institute has publicly stated on his website that he intends to vote for John Kerry. The reasoning he gives is that Bush's religious views and support from the religious right threaten our country with becoming a theocracy. I am a libertarian and do not strictly adhere to Rand's philosophy. However, I think Peikoff is an important voice for freedom. What do you make of this? Well, I have to say I make of it that the people at the Ayn Rand Institute uh, and Ayn Rand herself are kind of known for letting what other people might think are irrelevancies get in the way of their support or condemnation of various events, various organizations, various people. Ayn Rand, who had nothing against voting for presidential candidates, refused absolutely to support Reagan and spoke out against them at every opportunity simply because Reagan was opposed to abortion. Uh, as far as Rand was concerned, the idea that Reagan was talking about getting people, uh, government off of people's backs and the government was a problem, not the solution, and so forth, meant nothing to her. Uh, as long as he was for abortion, she would never support him. And I suppose she voted for Jimmy Carter in 1980. Of course, Reagan didn't turn out to be what he said he was during the 1980 campaign, but the point was that was all anybody had to go on at that time, and maybe you, you wouldn't vote at all for presidential candidates. Uh, uh, certainly that was my position, but if you were going to vote for them to 
vote for Jimmy Carter simply because Ronald Reagan was in favor of some kind of restrictions on abortion and thereby vote for what seemed to be the big government candidate as opposed to the little government candidate didn't seem to make much sense. And in the same way, this stand by Leonard Peikoff doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Uh, John Kerry, of course, is opposed to 90% of what the Ayn Rand Institute stands for and what Ayn Rand stood for, and I'd say 90%, it's probably more like 100%, and yet he will vote for Kerry simply because Kerry is not wearing his religion on his sleeve the way George Bush does. I don't really have to think we have to worry about George Bush's religious views. They are just an excuse for big government, for wars, for all kinds of things, just as uh, various other things that presidents and candidates have said in the past really didn't mean anything. They were just excuses to get elected or to go ahead and do something. Ashley in Tampa, Florida says, last week you were talking about public talking and giving speeches, but you were saying something, in fact, that as a libertarian candidate, you would sometimes write down certain points to get across or other notes, but you could address a variety of questions and answers from your libertarian point of view. And you do this as a radio host. You went on to say that most presidential candidates in recent times were ineffective even, uh, without knowing which questions were going to be asked, and professional speech writers had to coach them how to answer questions that they did anticipate in ways that many times skirt the known attempt of the question while still plugging one of their sound bites related to the question or not. You specifically put Bush in this category. Even knowing what the topic would be and no surprise questions, in the debate, Mr. Bush looked very uncomfortable and constantly fell back on repeating sound bites over and over. Terry did a little better, but then he didn't have Harry Brown asking the questions or anybody else. Ashley in Tampa, Florida, had sent me an email, which I read to you just before the break, in which she referred to what I said last week, I think it was last week, about the fact that these political candidates, if they really believed what they're saying and if they really had basic principles that they felt very strongly about, they would not need scripts to give speeches. They would not need to be primed uh, with regard to answering questions at debates because they would just simply speak from the heart and tell you what they believed about whatever the subject was. And you could see that in the third-party debate this past week. Neither Badnarik nor Cobb, who have considerably different viewpoints on a great many issues, although they agreed about civil liberties and about the war, they were both opposed to the war and in favor of civil liberties, but even though they disagreed on other things, they uh, both of them could speak very, very articulately and speak from the heart whenever they were asked a question, what, whatever it was about, gun control or anything, they just simply laid into it. Now, Possibly either one of them might have been helped by somebody who might come up with a nice turn of phrase to remember whenever this issue comes up. Uh, I picked up, oh, I would say, half a dozen to a dozen very good phrases from Michael Cloud when I was running. I've mentioned one of them on this show so many times, you're probably sick of it. And Michael Cloud coming up with the expression uh, that it is not the abuse of power that's the problem, it's the power to abuse, that once you give politicians power, it's sure to be abused. Something that I wish John Kerry had heard, because then he'd know that by giving George Bush the power to abuse, George Bush used that power and went and abused it by starting the war with Iraq. And Kerry gave him that power when he voted to give the blank check to let the president do whatever he wanted. And of course, now he's whining that George Bush didn't use that power correctly. Well, what did you expect? How long have you been in government, fellow? Did you learn anything from that? All right, David in Minneapolis says, that debate was the best advertisement for Michael Badnarik that I've seen so far. And he says there's uh, a scene in J.R.R. Tolkien's book, The Hobbit, where three trolls are arguing about the best way to kill and cook Bilbo and the dwarves they've captured. Much to the disappointment of Bilbo and the dwarves, none of them are arguing about whether they should kill and eat their captives. In other words, they were arguing about how to do it, not whether or not they should. And I think uh, David's point, well, in fact, he makes it here. All I heard on Thursday was Bush and Kerry arguing on how to do the wrong thing. Very good point. Bob, out there in cyberspace, says, Thanks for running a civil talk show. I hear so much hate-oriented conservative talk uh, where the host and listeners are ready to kill other citizens that it makes me sick. Why have conservatives now dominated talk radio? Before we went to the break, I mentioned about politicians having to have scripts, teleprompters, and so on, and being in difficult situations often when there were open questions that might be anything at all. And I just wanted to add that the third-party debate the other night was a good example of two candidates, able to be able to talk from their hearts and say whatever it was that they believed. And they did not need to be scripted. They did not need to have handlers telling them what to look out for and what to do. They may have had coaches in some way helping them to become better speakers, and that's always a good thing. I have, over my career, uh, had a number of speaking coaches in the sense that I have taken some courses in speaking. I have had two different, actually three different occasions I can think of where somebody has helped me work with TV camera and understand how to do it and so forth. All of that makes perfect sense so that I can be better able to say what I believe. But I never had anybody tell me that this is how you need to handle uh, this particular question when it comes up. This is what you have to say. This is what you have to do in order to be believed. 
And, you know, there's an interesting thing about this that applies even if you're never a candidate, and it's something you may want to take to heart. Back in 1970, when my first book came out, I was doing radio and TV talk shows around the country, and, and then you couldn't do radio on the telephone. It, uh, it was done occasionally, but it was not considered acceptable. You actually traveled around the country if you had a book to promote, and you did a bunch of shows in Pittsburgh, and then in Philadelphia, and then Washington, and then D.C., you know, and so forth and so on, and a few TV shows along the way. And this fellow had gotten in touch with me, who was a PR guy, and was just absolutely sure that he could do wonders to make me a star and make me a contender. And he was in, I think it was in uh, Miami, and when I went to Miami to do some talk shows, he was there, and he went to a radio station with me, and I answered questions as they came in from callers and so forth. And somebody called in, uh, incidentally, my book was called How You Can Profit from the Coming Devaluation, and it said in 1970 that inflation was going to get worse, the dollar would have to be devalued, and the gold, silver, and foreign currencies would be good investments, and that there were difficult times ahead. turned out to be right, uh, luckily because I might have said the same thing in 1965, five year, at least five years too soon, uh, but I believe the same thing in 1965. But it isn't important whether it turned out to be right. The important thing is, this is what I was talking about in 1970. And somebody who called in who didn't like what I was saying said, didn't you just write this in order to make money? And I said, of course. Why else would I do it? Why do you go to work every day? Don't you go to work to make money? And uh, so on and so forth. And that was pretty much the end of it. After the show was over, this PR man said to me, Oh, man, you never want to tell somebody that you did this to, write, to make money. What you should say is you did this because you want to help people. And I said, well, I do want to help people because only if I help people will they give me money. And I'm doing it to make money so I can pay my bills, so I can drive a car, so I can eat dinner, so that I can do a lot of things, you know, one of the most important of which being fly in first class instead of coach. And he said, but people don't want to hear that. And I said, well, let me just say this. Suppose I had said on the air, that I was doing this to help people, that that was my sole intention. I just wanted to help people, and I wasn't doing it for myself. Would you have believed me? And he said, no, I wouldn't have believed you, but other people would have. And I said, so you're saying that you're smart and everybody else is dumb. And he said, well, I wouldn't put it that way. And I said, well, what, how else would you put it? If you think that you can see through such a transparently um, cliche remark as that, but you don't think anybody else can, you're saying that these people are too dumb to see the obvious. Well, I don't think they are too dumb to see the obvious, and I think there are probably a lot of people who are listening who appreciated the fact that I just simply told the truth, and they might be more inclined to read my book knowing that I'm not uh, presenting some kind of fictitious scenario uh, just because it sounds good, but rather I'm writing and telling what I believe. And if I were to make this stupid statement about I'm just doing this to help people, then whether or not they really consciously focus on it, at least unconsciously, they're going to think to, myself, to themselves, oh, God, one more idiot up there trying to make me believe the impossible. But this all comes back again to what people say in these debates and on campaign speeches and so on. You have to be honest with people. You have to tell them, I don't know the answer to that, and I'm not sure there is a good answer to it, uh, but if you've got something you want to suggest, let me know. But right now, I don't know the answer to that, if that's the case, if you don't know the answer. And if you believe something that other people you that you think other people don't believe and that other people won't like you for try it try saying the truth you may be surprised that a lot of other people are hiding the truth also because they're afraid no one could possibly understand them believing that craig writes and says i turned off my cable three weeks ago i kept the local channels but i'm no longer piping in fox news or cnn when i feel the need to get news i fire up free market news network fmnn which is the network i was talking about in the last hour free market news network is definitely on to something here also, the bush Kerry debates were the topic of conversation Friday morning at the office, the day afterwards. He said, almost every one of my colleagues, about nine of us that sit together, concurred that both candidates are at best lemons and at worst very dangerous. So I forwarded a LewRockwell.com article to a colleague on the subject of not wasting your vote or don't vote at all. Her response to the article, and I quote, quote, I saw at least 17 people at work reading this article yesterday, end quote. And Craig says, can you imagine? I was shocked to learn that a large number of people at my office are reading LewRockwell.com. Even if she was exaggerating her numbers, this is still encouraging. One more sign that there is a shift taking place in the way people are looking at things. Craig winds up by saying, your comments? Well, my comment, Craig, is, amen, brother. That's wonderful. That is very good news. Before I get back to Free Market News Network, I have got to tell you that when I left for the news break at the top of the hour, I said when we come back, I was going to finish up on something, and then, of course, when we came back, I was thinking, what was it I was going to finish up on? Oh, my, what was it? And I thought I remembered and started telling you something that I'd already talked about before. Oh, it's really difficult when you pass 30. Something happens to your mind. With me, it started when I passed 6. 
What I was supposed to talk about was the email that I got from Bob that I read just before we went to the break, where he said, I hear so much hate-oriented conservative talk during the day and night where the host and listeners are ready to kill other citizens, and it makes me sick. Why, in your opinion, do the conservative talk shows dominate radio? Is it just that the liberals are busy listening to music and the conservatives have no life except to criticize people that don't believe what they believe? Well, it is an interesting phenomenon, Bob, and I really don't have an answer, and I would be glad to hear any ideas that are presented from other people. For a long time, it was a truism that the liberals dominated the media. That meant, basically, newspapers, magazines, and television. But nobody thought that much about radio because radio was you know, uh, not that important in the scheme of things. It was uh, sort of on the back burner, and there wasn't uh, that much talk radio, although there have always been talk shows and call-in shows and so forth. But in all the years that I did book promotions and things of that sort, and I always wound up getting into political subjects when I did book promotions, I don't remember getting the impression that there were very many conservatives in talk radio. You'd see one here and there, and I remember some of them, and I remember them because they were exceptional. But I remember a lot of liberal talk show hosts like Michael Jackson out in Los Angeles, an excellent host, but one with whom I found I had a lot to disagree with. But he's the kind of civil in, uh, individual with whom you're glad to have a discourse on things you disagree. But then along came Rush Limbaugh. And conservatives, of course, flocked to him because he was so exceptional, because he's, he was one guy who was standing up for the conservative positions. But then why the proliferation of this, I don't know. And I think that the answer can only come from somebody who's been intimately connected with talk radio for many, many years, like 15 or 20 years, so that he would have been in talk radio before this conservative deluge and would have some idea of why this came about, how it came about, how it started, and so forth and so on. Because, as Bob points out, they are dominating the radio airwaves now, and the network that started about six months ago, the liberal network on which Al Franken appears and some other uh, liberal talk show hosts, people who weren't talk show hosts before but are taking on talk shows, uh, that hasn't been doing all that well. And it just is really strange. You don't get the feeling so much anymore either that television is dominated by liberals. Part of the reason is that the focus is not so much liberal or conservative, but on big government. The people on television will do whatever the government wants because they want access to the government. I have to say, as I've said so many times before, that 90% of what we know about the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, and matters of this kind, we get from the government, even though it comes through CNN or Fox News or the Washington Post or the Associated Press or whatever it may be, because that's the only place most people in the media can get information about these things. They get handouts from the government, briefings at the Defense Department, at the State Department, and so on. Uh, press conferences from Donald Rumsfeld, George Bush, Dick Cheney, and so on. So the point is that these media, whether they're liberal or conservative, whether they're television or radio or newspapers or whatever, are getting this information and just repeating it. And so it's a little wonder that everybody in the country, or it seems like everybody in the country, obviously it's not. You and I are not fooled by this. Uh, it seems, though, that people uh, just simply go along, that George Bush is doing a wonderful job fighting the war on terror, leading this country, and sure, he has done some things that I disagree with, but he's been, we all have to agree, that he responded courageously to 9-11 and has led this country well. Why do we think that? Because all the information we get was fed from the Bush administration. So what else are we going to think? but what the Bush administration wants us to think. So talk radio would provide an alternative to that, and there would be some skepticism and criticism, except that talk radio is, generally speaking, in favor of George Bush and the Republicans. They're in favor of George Bush because he's a Republican, and all they care about is making sure that Republicans are in the White House. I want to clarify uh, this free market news network. Uh, you go to the website, and on the right-hand side is the waste no vote section, which is coverage of the election and pushing the idea that you should vote for a third party candidate or not vote at all rather than vote for the Republicans or Democrats. You do, to get into that section, you do have to join what they call the Free Market News Network community. Joining costs nothing and it incurs no responsibilities. You don't have to show up at meetings. <laughs> you don't have to pay dues. You don't have to vote. All that happens as a result of joining is Number one, you get access to some of these areas that are not open to just any old people, not open to the riffraff, in other words. But the second thing is that having joined, you will then get emails from Free Market News Network telling you about new things that have been posted to the site. And I think lately those emails have been running about one a day. But they're not going to kill you to get those emails, and you may find that there's something on there that they're telling you about that, yes, you do want to go to the site and look at, read, or listen to. So I would strongly suggest that if you like the site, and I think it's very, very well designed, that it would be a good idea to go ahead and join. 
and let us now take a phone call from Aaron in Michigan. Good evening, Aaron. Hey, Aaron, how are you doing? I'm just fine. What's up? Uh, nothing. I'm, at, uh, I'm a student at MFU. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, Michigan, uh, meaning Michigan me. State University, yeah. And uh, I've heard a lot of talk since the debate about, uh, you know, Kerry and Bush and who's right and who's, uh, who's an idiot and so forth. And one thing I noticed from the debate when they were mentioning Iraq and North Korea was, I think John Kerry said that it was America's responsibility to take care of, uh, um, you know, the problems abroad. Mm-hmm. But no one has ever given a reason why it's our responsibility except because. Well, the only reason that's, that's given that makes any sense at all, which does not mean that it's right or that you have to agree with it, but at least it is plausible, is what they call the Pottery Barn uh, principle that I think uh, Colin Powell was the one who coined it, which is the Pottery Barn being a big store in New York, that if you break it, you have to pay for it. And the idea is that Americans broke Iraq, and so Americans are responsible to go over and rebuild it. My feeling is that Americans are not responsible. George Bush is responsible for it, and John Kerry is too, because he voted the blank check for George Bush, and of course a lot of others, Dick Cheney and so on. First thing that should be done is that their wages should be docked, they should be, his, their wages should be attached and put into a fund to help rebuild Iraq, their pensions should be canceled, and all the money that would have gone into the pensions should go into a fund to rebuild Iraq. Now, you get all the people who in any way were responsible for this, and you're not talking about a great deal of money. Uh, but maybe you could attach some of their personal fortunes. I don't know. But you still wouldn't have a great deal of money, and you're left with a lot of ruin there in Iraq that would not, uh, the reconstruction of which would not be paid for. And so perhaps the next step then would be to try to raise money voluntarily in the United States to help the poor Iraqis who were decimated by an evil conqueror. Yeah. Uh, that's all I can think of. Right. Uh, you have any thoughts on it? Um, yeah, I was just one like, uh, I, I remember what they, exactly what they were talking about. They were talking about a, uh, another civil war in Africa. Oh, the genocide in the Sudan? Yeah, yeah, that, we're, that Kerry wants to get involved in, I think. And mm-hmm. I'm just wondering why anything like that was the, uh, what, what reason they have for us. Well, being well obviously, it's not, not the responsibility of the United States government. And it is my belief that you should be free to give money to either side in that battle in the Sudan. You should be free to buy a gun, a rifle, a submachine gun, an Uzi, whatever it is you want, and go over there and fight on either side in the Sudan. But unfortunately, it's against the law for you to do so. Right. You're, you're not allowed to get into foreign policy disputes on one side or the other, but with that law should be repealed so that you're free to do whatever you want, to send money, to send your own body, uh, to sacrifice your children, if you're going to be like, it, it was it Abraham that uh, almost did that? Yeah. Whatever it may be, but you do not have the right, of course, to compel somebody else to send money through taxes or any other mean to support the one side or the other in the Sudan or any place else around the earth, all foreign aid should be canceled, all military aid should be canceled, all the troops should be brought home, the 702 American military bases overseas should be closed, America should have no part in any of these battles. And if America had no part in any of these battles, there wouldn't be a 9-11 because the terrorists, the thugs around the world who like to stir up trouble would not be able to get the help of innocent, well-meaning people who are upset uh, who today are very upset about what the U.S. has done and are willing to help the terrorists. They, the terrorists wouldn't get that help if we didn't give them cause to. And when right. I say we, that's a misnomer. I plead innocence. I didn't have anything to do with it. So, any any further thought, Aaron? Nope, thanks a lot, Aaron. Well, thank you for calling. I appreciate it. Uh, David from Minneapolis says on John Kerry's website, Kerry says that he stands by his vote for the USA Patriot Act. He emphasizes, however, that he objects to the way that Ashcroft, John Ashcroft, the Attorney General, uses the act to threaten people's liberty. <laughs> Maybe if John Kerry were to read the Patriot Act, he would find that John Ashcroft has the authority under the Patriot Act to use the act to threaten people's liberty. Going on with what David says, Ashcroft, or pardon me, Kerry insists that if he were president, he would only use it to go after the bad guys and never abuse it the way Ashcroft does. Oh, sure, John Kerry. Even if John Kerry can be trusted on this point, that is, even if we can be sure that his attorney general won't be another Janet Reno, he still needs to understand that the act is dangerous. Kerry can be president only for eight years. Who's to say that his successor won't resume using the USA Patriot Act in a harmful manner, the way George Bush and John Ashcroft had? And David goes on to say Michael Cloud's slogan is very applicable to this issue. Another good slogan is the one about considering the impact of today's decisions on the next seven generations. In that vein, politicians need to consider how today's laws will be misused by the next administration. Some people claim that the gun control laws passed by the non-Nazi Weimar government in Germany were later misused to oppress people after Hitler was elected. Well, Hitler passed gun control laws also, but the point is that the Weimar republics set the stage and set the precedent by saying that there had to be some restrictions on guns. Does that sound familiar? And then the next administration, that of Adolf Hitler, decided, well, since there have to be some restrictions on gun ownership, 
We have decided that those restrictions should be, well, let's see now. I know. Let's make all guns illegal. Okay, everybody, line up and turn in your guns, and all right, everybody's guns are turned in now? All right. Guess what? You people have no power anymore, and we've got total power, and we're going to use it any way we want to. We're going to open concentration camps. We're going to haul people off. We're going to persecute the Jews. We're going to do anything we want because there's nothing you can do to stop us. Well, it's interesting also that I have found in my studies of these things how many people supported Adolf Hitler as he was doing some of these things simply because he was standing up to the French and the British and the other people. And so many people today support George Bush, whatever he does, because, God, it would be awful if we had John Kerry for president. Jim, out in cyberspace, says, to be fair to the Pottery Barn, they don't have a you-break-it-you-bought-it policy. I believe the White House had to apologize for Colin Powell's remark. Well, thank you for letting us know that. Uh, just mentioning Iraq, the war in Iraq, and Pottery Barn in the same sentence is quite a disservice to Pottery Barn, whatever their policy is. And I wouldn't blame them if they had a you-break-it-you-pay-for-it policy. But, uh, of course, you know... Many times uh, I have been in an antique store and seen a sign of some kind that says, if you break it, you bought it. All right, but there are people out here that know a lot more about these things than I do. Let's talk with Jeff in Arizona. Good evening, Jeff. Good evening, Harry. Thank you. What's on your mind tonight? I'd like, well, number one, uh, on my mind is, is voting. Uh, I'd like your opinion on uh, an observation of yours, Chris. Do you think a victory by John Kerry would uh, uh, truncate uh, Hillary Clinton's political future? I don't really know. It would, of course, put it off for eight years because unless Kerry's uh, first term were an absolute disaster, not just a disaster in our minds, but in the minds of the general public, he would run for re-election in 2008, and that would put Hillary off to 2012. I, to a certain extent, I believe Hillary Clinton is a, cre- a creation of the conservatives. I believe that the whole idea of Hillary Clinton possibly becoming president is something the conservatives have really created to try to use it for fundraising and to keep people scared and to say, you've got to vote for George Bush, or we've got to have Republicans, or we've got to do this, or whatever it is. I don't know that Hillary Clinton re- even has the hope of becoming president, and I don't know whether Democrats, uh, who are influential and important and might have a hand in helping to select the next Democratic nominee, even care about Hillary Clinton. Uh, all I know is that conservatives just keep harping on the possibility that Hillary will be running in 2008 and this, that, and the other thing. Do you have any specific knowledge that uh, Hillary Clinton is really uh, a front-runner for the next candidate uh, for the, the um, presidency from the Democrats? Oh, very little. The only knowledge, if we can say that, is I'm uh, turtling through Dick Morris's book on Hillary, which is uh, uh, more than scary. He wrote a book specifically about her? Yes, it's a, as, as an observer, and he... Uh, what well, we should say for the benefit of anybody who doesn't know that Dick Morris was the chief political consultant to Bill Clinton and... He has, since uh, Clinton left office, Morris has been a a big uh, commentator on, it's on Fox News Network, isn't it? Uh, I don't know about the network, but uh, the book was a gift, and uh, uh, I I would summarize to me as, uh, it's kind of like looking at fascinating roadkill. You know it's going to smell, but it's more interesting to look at than some others. (laughs) Uh, That's not quite fair to anybody, I don't think, but uh, I I do hear that as being touted by some quote-unquote Republican loyalists as, well, you've got to vote for Kerry, because that will truncate Hillary. And Mm. I, I kind of recoil at using that kind of logic as to why I would want to spend my vote. Uh, I yeah, have, doesn't say much for your self-respect. Well, yes, and I had a teacher who, who used to argue, don't even think about one versus the other. No matter who you vote for, it's going to be worse than the previous one. <laughs> and the next one will be worse yet. So, See, not all schools are bad. <laughs> uh, it was a very interesting school. It was a private school, by the way. Uh, oh, for good. And I, I have to agree with that uh, from observation, my own, as opposed to what I read. Thank you for your program. I appreciate it, and I look forward to the next broadcast. Oh, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate your comments. Let's see if we can squeeze in Al in New Mexico before we go to the next break. Al, are you with us? Yes, sir. Uh, great show, Harry. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you picked up on one thing in the day that really struck me, and that is that both candidates went out of their way to try to say that this was better for the security of Israel. Did you did you notice that? Well, no, I didn't see the debate, and I only read about a quarter of the transcript, okay. and so I guess I didn't get that far. But that's very common, is uh, that you've got to appeal, frankly, to the Jewish vote in America, and there's nothing anti-Semitic about that, just like right. they appeal to the Hispanic vote, and they appeal to right. the black vote, and so on. And any presidential candidate from the two major parties who got up and said, we need to terminate all aid to Israel, uh, would probably be burned at the stake by morning. Well, I, I, it struck me, because I thought, are these guys running for Prime Minister of Israel, or are they running for President of the United States? <laughs> and I think it's actually also the Christian vote uh, in the Southeast, particularly, that, that votes very staunchly pro-Israel. Yes, there, uh, there are religious reasons for that, which we don't need to, to get into, but uh, right. fundamentalist Christians believe very strongly that the state of Israel must be preserved uh, for reasons of the rapture, or I'm not sure what it is, the second coming. Uh, but in any event, uh, that, that adds to the Jewish vote, and it creates an enormous block in this country that is determined that uh, AIDS Israel will persist no matter what. I want to mention that Jason 
out there sent an email about people uh, being too lazy and uninformed and want to be taken care of by the state, and that's why we have a welfare state. We don't have time to go into that tonight, Jason, and I don't like to carry questions over from one week to the next. So if you will email me that question or phone it in next week, I will be glad to cover it. And especially one evening when we don't have a guest, it would make an excellent topic for the evening to get us started, along with whatever else anybody brings up. But right now we're talking to Al in New Mexico. And, Al, you had a further thought you were going to add? Uh, yes, um... One thing uh, is that anyone, it seems that anyone who criticizes our policy towards Israel or Israel's policy towards its neighbors, they're just cast off as anti-Semites and no one ever hears from them again. And one thing I noticed also in the days is that they were talking about Saddam Hussein needed to go to make the world safer for Iraq's neighbors. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take a rocket surge and say, well, maybe we there was heavy Israel influence in that whole decision whether to go into Iraq. Sure. And yeah, because none of, the, none of the neighbors were complaining about Hussein beforehand. In fact, they were all uh, very much opposed to the idea of the war with the exception of Israel. Right, um, and one of this is actually one of the issues where I agree 100% with Ralph Nader on, and um, you know he, he said that Ariel Sharon basically comes to the White House and he meets with his chief puppet, and it's all yes sir, what can I do for you sir, and then he meets with everyone in Congress and leaves with billions of taxpayer dollars, yes. and um, and there's no there's no discourse about that in Israel. There's they do debate whether they should be doing that or not, and yes. it's, it's, it's stifled here. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. There is more controversy over Israel in Israel than there is in this country. And, and by that, controversy over Israel's policy towards uh, the other Middle Eastern countries and all of that. But the U.S. will do whatever Israel decides. Al, thanks very much for your call. And, folks, there's a whole wide world out there for you to enjoy this week. I hope you won't let what John Kerry and George Bush say get you down. Instead, do something for yourself and your family this week. This is Harry Brown. Come back next week. <laughs> 